Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. We want to invite you to stand to your feet. If you're watching online, turn the music up. Worship with us this morning. Come on, everybody. Let's go. Man, I am so thankful to be here this morning, man, worshiping with our, my brothers and sisters at church. I am too. And if it is the first time that you've been with us, maybe it's the first time in a long time. One thing I love about New Year's around church life is it's always a time where the Lord uses some prioritizing and some time management for a lot of people to go, 
man, I want to make my life at church more significant in 2022. Well, we have got a way for you to do that. Next Sunday, after our second service, we will have OBC 101. It is a class where you can learn more about our church, what we believe in, what our vision is, how you can be a part of it, and we will provide child care and lunch for that. So we just need to know you are coming. So you can sign up in all the digital ways. You can go right across the lobby to the guest services area and get signed up there. But we want you to be at OBC 101 if you've never been there before. Absolutely, and if you are interested in giving this morning while you're here, joining in on what God is doing here at OBC, you can give at our giving kiosk located out in the lobby, or there'll be ushers as you leave if you'd like to give by cash or check. And then also, we know with a new year comes all kinds of new things going on in our lives, and we want to be praying for you. So whether it's something for you or for someone else in your life, we want to know. We want you to know that your church loves you. We're praying for you right now. There's a group of folks praying for you while you're in service right now. You can submit prayer requests in lots of different ways on our mobile app, on our website, or you can go down to a prayer kiosk at the end of the hallway. There's a purple banner there. You can stop by, fill out a prayer request, and have someone pray with you before you leave this afternoon. I got somebody that you and everybody else could be praying for 24-7. Guess who it is? Um... I give up. My wife. That is very Holy true. Holy smokes. Can yes. you imagine being married to me? What happened to this marriage gig? Like, how did this get so hard? My goodness gracious. Everybody told me there's two things that you really ought to be doing in your marriage. Well, you got five kids, so I can imagine what oh, one of the two things is. Oh, canceled. <laughs> He's trying to get me in trouble. The two things are, have lots of date nights and laugh a lot. You're welcome. We have got a way for you to do both of those at one time. Man, I'm really excited about an event we're going to have on February the 12th right here at OBC. It's called Never Stop Laughing. It's a marriage event. We're going to have dinner all together. Uh, There'll be a live Christian comedian and uh, the director of Dare to Be Different Marriage Ministries, Matt Lair, will be here. And uh, it is going to be a great night. It's February the 12th, guys. We're putting it on a T for you. It's $20. Sign you and your wife up. You can do it all the digital ways, on the app, on the website. Go across the hallway. If you are married, be here for Never Stop Laughing. Nice try. Sorry. Hey, with a new year comes all kinds of new things. And one of the things that I love starting new at our church is a new series. And so starting next week, Pastor Steve is kicking off a brand new series of messages called Under Construction. You can look around, you can see our building, man, it is under construction. But also not just the building, but our lives is always under construction. God is making us more and more into the image of his son. And so over the next few weeks, we're going to find out what that looks like for not only the the building, but it looks like for us to always be a process in work. So we're super excited about that. Yeah, me too, man. One of the things that, man, this whole process in work, uh, God has really been um, impressing upon me just what a big deal missions is at our church. It goes all the way back to celebrate Christmas where we took up that love offering for hope givers. And then we've been praising God for the Ochoas and what's going on in Costa Rica. And last week uh, with the speaker that we had, who's somebody we support, and then this week's going to be the same thing. I know that the Lord is probably doing in you what he's doing in me, is churning this thing up about how you can be involved more in taking the gospel to people locally people nationally, and people globally. So if that's you, here's what you need to do. We have a conversation every Sunday morning at 11 o'clock called Next Steps. Very laid back. Uh, We will uh, just ask you a few questions and get you uh, plugged into the right places. Man, there's a lot of variables, um, COVID and airline travel and just all kinds of things that that affect uh, missions and how we go. And so we want to make sure that when we can get ready and go, that everybody uh, is ready and on the same page. So if you're interested in how you can be on the go, go to next steps and that sir is all for us man praise the lord that was long wasn't it yes hey stand up find somebody around you tell them good morning it almost got longer There is love that- 
One of the things I want to do this year is to put people in front of you that we're supporting all over the world. Because it's easy uh, to see uh, a budget line item or hear a story, but when you hear from the person, it's impacting. And man, we, we are doing missions all over the world and all over America. And one of the ministries that we've been supporting for many, many years is Alpine Bible Church in Lehigh, Utah. And Nathaniel Wall, dear friend, wonderful servant of the Lord. You're going to hear from him today. And, you know, Utah is um, a place that's pristine in the setting of the Rocky Mountains. And, uh, you, you know, there's not poverty and there's not heartache where you just see children in dire need. But it's one of the most spiritually dark places on planet Earth because of the lie of Mormonism. And I just love what our brother does there. And he's going to tell you all about that today and encourage us. You're going to be so blessed to hear from him. Aren't you glad we have a God who is sovereign over this whole world and cares about this whole world and cares about people in Lehigh, Utah knowing him so he sent a man there but he cares about you and he cares about this church and he cares about the very details and pains and worries and distresses of your life that's who God is so right now would you just join me in prayer Father we just come to you right now we just acknowledge who you are you are the Lord God Almighty And there is nothing out of your reach, nothing that escapes your eye. Lord, you love every person on planet Earth, wherever they are. And you died for every one of them. People in Utah and people in Eden and the people standing in this room right now, God, you love them. And you care about them. And sometimes, God, we forget that the same God who created this whole universe cares about the things we're going through and the struggles of our hearts. God, we have people in our church family right now who, who are really sick and Rhonda Evans is in the hospital with COVID pneumonia and just this morning her husband Keith had to be admitted in the same hospital, Lord. There are people here right now, God, who are grieving still because somebody they love has died. There are people here right now, God, who are worried Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's financial. Maybe, God, it's a situation that just seems out of their control. God, whatever it is right now, could you just let them know that there is nothing out of your control and they can trust you. Thank you, God, for being our God and for loving us the way you love us. We are so grateful. And we pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.
One day desire One day the stronger Than any grave Than any throne Christ exalted over all From the grave Where death would die You rose again And brought us life Your reigning now The Savior see it is a joy for me to be able to be here and share with you a little bit today. I, I, am, I am so thankful for this church. If there's anything that we accomplished by the end of today, one of the things I, I really want to walk away with you aware of is, is how important um, your participation, your involvement, your love for this church here, because when this church uh, thrives in Jesus, and this is a wonderful church family to be a, a, a part of, it, it is it has uh, effects well beyond you that sometimes you're not even aware of. And I, I represent one of those parts of our country in the state of Utah, where your love for Jesus has ripple effects all the way to where I am today. Uh, my name is Nathaniel Wall. I'm a, a pastor in Utah. I, I, I moved to Utah as a missionary church 
church planter uh, to reach that area of the world for Christ. And some of you may be wondering if you don't know a whole lot about Utah, or maybe you just know a little bit about Utah, but it is where uh, the, the headquarters for the Mormon church is located, which has about 16 million members worldwide, about 60,000 missionaries around the world. And uh, Mormonism, when I, when I talk about Mormonism, sometimes people ask me the question, are you Mormon? I am not Mormon. <laughs> All right. Okay. But, but I am there to, uh, to reach them. And I, I love what I do. I love the Mormon people there. They are a kind hearted, well-meaning people. Uh, but one of the things that is confusing about their faith with, with where, where I live today is uh, they, they talk about Christianity, Mormonism. In fact, if you if you engage someone that's Mormon, they'll often talk about themselves being a, a Christian because they'll say they believe in a Jesus. Um, but what's interesting about Mormonism is it denies every major uh, belief of Christianity. And so I, I don't have a whole lot of time to dive into theology of Mormonism, but I, I do want to share this with you. If you ever have the opportunity to engage someone that comes from a, a Mormon faith, or they'll often refer to themselves as LDS, I could ask the question, what do we do? Uh, I know here in, in our, the community here locally, you have a, a Mormon ward where people worship. Uh, what do you do when you talk to someone who is, who is Mormon? I, I'll tell you, it's the same thing that you do to, with someone who, who claims to be Christian. There's a lot of people that claim to be Christian that have no idea what it means to follow Jesus. They use the term, but have no connection to the identity or what it really means to put their faith in Christ. And, and when I engage someone that's LDS, I, I do the same thing, or Mormon, I do the same thing with them that I do with anyone else in, in the world, and, and that is to simply say, who is Jesus? Let's just talk about Jesus. Rather than argue as to whether or not you are truly a Christian or not with an LDS person, we just want to talk about who is Jesus. Because reality is there may be someone in the room this morning that claims to be Christian that has no idea who Jesus really is. And that is the, the most important question because it should define everything uh, uh, about who we are because God made us. And to know who he is helps me better understand who I am and living in lie to him. And so, uh, and wanting to, the desire to reach that, that people group. And in 2005, my wife and I, we got a picture of my, my family, but my wife and I, we moved to the state of, uh, of Utah in order to, uh, to, to reach the LDS people there. The state of Utah is about 67% Mormon now. And we moved to a particular area of Utah. We moved to Utah County, Utah, which is a very original name for that county. Is Utah County, Utah. And Utah County has about 700,000 people, estimated at 1% Christian. We have one church for every 28,000 people in the county of Utah. It's like saying we take two Edens and there's one church between two Edens. That's, that's how big the need is uh, where we are. So my wife and I, we moved just south of Salt Lake City. I don't know if you can see the blue dot there on the map, but we live directly in between Provo, Utah and, and Salt Lake City, Utah. Provo, Utah is where Brigham Young University is located and Salt Lake City is where the Mormon church is located. So that's right in the main, the main artery. And we, we helped start a church in 2005 in a town called Eagle Mountain, 43,000 people, started the only church to exist in that city. We moved over to towns east to the town of Lehi, and Lehi has about 80,000 people, and you guys participated with us when we started the ministry in Lehi, and we built the first ever church building to exist in that city. Still is the only church building to exist in that city. We bought an old bar and turned it into a church, and so here in a couple hours after, after this service concludes, they'll start their service in, in Utah, gathering there to, to praise the Lord, and it is because of OBC. There are, there are two churches that were very central in getting beh behind us, and seeing that happen, one in Huntington, West Virginia, and one here, you guys. And, and being able to see that um, take place is just a it's, a, it's a miracle to be able to walk in that city and, and see the hand of the Lord uh, making itself known uh, in, in among our community there as, as they gather to worship. And on this map now, not only are we, have we helped plant a church in Eagle Mountain, Utah, and, and in Lehigh, Utah, but now uh, we've expanded our scope, and I am now a church plant catalyst for the state of Utah, which means all of those blue dots on the map there, those are all churches that I am now responsible for. Those are active church plants or revitalization works that are going on in the state of Utah where we're helping to establish brand new churches or, or helping churches that are on their last leg. A couple, couple of those are our revitalization projects. And then the, the yellow 
represents areas that we're going to be planning churches here in the future. Um, just this past week, I have a, a family from Virginia called that's moving to Utah to plant a church, and then one from Mississippi that's planning to be there in May that, that we're going to be working with to plant a church. And so by God's grace, my dream in moving to Utah was to see a church in every city, in every town. If I could end my days in just one church for every community where I live. And I, I w I'm just so thankful the Lord even has a, a place for me to serve him there. But just the, the reality of, of knowing that there are, there are still cities in America where thousands of people are. I mean, I can walk out of Lehigh, Utah, where I live, and head to the next two towns east of me, uh, Alpine and Cedar Hills, over 10,000 people in each town, and never, never had a church. There is a tremendous need for the gospel, and your love for Jesus gives us opportunity to continue, to continue that work there. You know, when not living in Utah, when I wake up in the morning, it is exhilarating for me. It feels like the front lines of, of ministry. I, I wake up and I, I realize... Man, I might be the only person that, that people interact with that's a Christian today. And to me, that brings, that, it just gets me all excited to wake up in the morning to think that out of everybody that I interact with, I may be the only Christian all these people talk to today. What an opportunity it is for the gospel. And then there are other days where I wake up. And the reality of that sits in and I say things like, I may be the only Christian somebody interacts with today. And some days feels exhilarating. Other days it feels overwhelming. And guys, it's, it's been interesting within our country in the last couple of years, that overwhelming feeling seems to um, permeate throughout all of our country now. Things seem a little difficult, a, a little bit overwhelming. I, I read an article in Forbes magazine. They had published a work from an international article that talked about the decline of the democracy of America. It was a depressing article. <laughs> it seems th that things are unraveling in our country, in our culture. Overwhelming for all of us. And so the question I, I, I want to ask for us this morning in order to encourage us and, and seeing things are, are getting a, maybe a little more adverse is how do you advance when you feel defeated? How do you move forward when you feel discouraged? And how do you adv advance when you feel defeated? You ever have those days where you know the truth of the, uh, of the gospel and how important it is, but the way that you're kind of dealing with that on the inside, you just feel like raising the white flag saying, forget it, best days are uh, behind us. Let's build the bunker and everybody, everybody hunker down. <laughs> but you know, when I think about uh, the, the beauty of the Christian message, guys, it, it always brings hope. And I, I, I like to consider that for, for us, I think uh, as a followers of Jesus, the greatest days are in front of us. I know it may look a little different right now. The, the darkness may seem to be pushing, but historically, Christianity has always done well when we're the underdog. How, how do you advance when you feel defeated? I'm going to... I'm going to invite to John chapter 14 this morning. John 14 is a beautiful passage of scripture where Jesus is, is dealing with this with his disciples and, and working through a, a moment where they feel defeated. If I said some of my, my favorite portions of scripture, John chapter 13 to John chapter 17, if it's, if it's not number one for me, I don't know what is. This, this section of the Bible is, is the section where Jesus goes into the upper room with his disciples Jesus is choosing to spend the last six hours of his life on earth in the most intimate of settings in the upper room with, with his followers. And he's teaching them some of the most beautiful instruction that he, he gave his followers on what it means to be a, a disciple after Jesus' heart. Incredible story. I mean, John 13 opens up with the washing of the feet and he tells us to love one another. But it's also the chapter where Jesus looks to his disciples and says, one of you is going to betray me. One of you is going to deny me. 
and I'm going to die. And the reality of that moment sinks in for those disciples. You know, I think they've given up the last three years of their life to pursue Jesus. And now th- their leader is telling them that he's going to die. And with him, that so goes the death of the movement. And what are they going to do? Because if, if Jesus is getting killed and, and, and they've been identified as his closest followers, what's going to happen to them? That sense of feeling overwhelmed. How, how do you advance when you feel Defeated. Point number one. Point number one, find a hope beyond the circumstance. Find a hope beyond the circumstance. Human beings are resilient in adversity as long as they have hope. In John chapter 14, that's where Jesus begins with his disciples. There's always discouragement that we can discover in following this world because this, this world's going to rub against us, right? But discouragement doesn't have to be a bad thing because discouragement means there's something in you that cares and you want to see a difference made. And so in the middle of that discouragement, what our soul needs is, is hope. And Jesus starts in, in, in John 14, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in in me. The disciples had, had every reason to feel troubled. The leader of the movement was about to, to go, but Jesus becomes an incredible example about, uh, of how hope gives us opportunity to continue to move forward in life. In fact, in, in, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, about Jesus, it says, uh, he in, endured the cross for the joy set before him. The reason Jesus went through what he went through is because he had a greater hope in this world for us. Human beings are incredibly adverse when they have hope. In verse 2, it goes on and says this, In my Father's house are many rooms. If that were not so, I would have told you. Because I'm going there to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I'm coming again, and I will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you also may be. You know, when you think about struggle in your life, when we go through hardship, when we go through adversity, our tendency is, as people, we become withdrawn. We start to internalize. We wonder if anybody cares. We focus within ourselves, right? In, in John chapter 14, verse 2, Jesus is doing something very powerful, very, it's incredible for his disciples. He's, he's definitely reading the room. He knows where their heart is. He knows where their soul is. He, he cares about him. He loves about him. And he's showing it by something culturally here that we often don't pick up on in verse 2. Uh, when we read this passage of scripture, many times people like to think that this passage just deals with uh, how, many, how many rooms Jesus has got in his house, right? Like, or, or how big your mansion's going to be when you get to heaven. That's not God's point in this story to talk about how many mansions he's going to have because of how many people are following him or how many rooms you might get to when you get to eternity. The point of what Jesus is saying is he desires, he's got plenty of room for you in eternity and he desires for you to be there. And he wants to illustrate this very personally. In, in fact, the way Jesus is doing this is he's, he's, he's diving into the most, uh, the most intimate of human relationships. What Jesus is actually talking about here is, is marriage. In, in Jesus' day, it was, it was the, the desire of a young man, if you want to marry a, a young woman, he would go find uh, the, the father of his hopeful future bride. And he would sit down with the, the father and he would discuss a dowry that he would pay in order to marry his, this, this father's daughter he, so he could have a bride. And so they would discuss a dowry. The young man would pay the dowry in order to, to celebrate that, that betrothal they re- refer to it as. In order to celebrate that betrothal, they would partake of communion together. And from that point on, that young man would get up and he would go to his father's house and he would start to prepare a place for his bride to come back and receive her to himself. And in this story, Jesus is using that same illustration of a betrothal to, to show us his desire for you in relationship to him. 
that there is no extent that Jesus won't go in order to have you connected to him. In fact, when you think about this illustration as it relates to Jesus' life, Jesus came, Jesus paid a dowry, and the dowry Jesus offered for you was his own life. When we partake of communion, it's a symbol of that dowry that he paid so that we could belong to him. And Jesus, Jesus is saying, I know when you go through hardship, you feel alone. But I pursue you furiously, sacrificially. There is no extent that I won't go that you could belong to me. And in my place, there is plenty of room. And I have come to give my life that you could belong in the promise that I will return again in my father's house. There are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. But behold, I go to prepare a place for you that where and there, there you may be also. Jesus gives us hope. Jesus gives us worth and identity and purpose and meaning that our life would, would be lived for this king. And then Jesus goes on, point number two in your notes. He goes on from here and he encourages us to trust the promises of Jesus. Trust in the promises of Jesus. I know this is a, a very simplistic thought. Trust in the promises of Jesus, guys, but this is so important for our lives to cling to because I know in, in reading scripture and, and anecdotally just watching human nature, when we face adversity, we quickly and oftentimes forget the promises of God. In fact, one of the promises that you find in the Bible repeated over and over and, and oftentimes to people that we would look at as spiritual giants in scripture it's, it's the promise that God will always be with you. He'll never forsake you, never abandon you. Over 365 times, it's, it's recorded in the Bible, one for every day of the week, they say, because, because as people, we always need that reminder uh, of God's presence and God's promises because what happens in our lives is we get so fixated on the problems that we forget how great our God is. In John 14, verse six, Jesus says this. And Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You think in, in the mind of the disciples right now, they're concerned for their well-being. If Jesus is going to die, and I'm seen as a follower of Jesus, What's going to happen to me? Yeah, I deal with that in a, in a social way in Utah, that coming to Christ in America is not, uh, shouldn't cost your life in a physical sense, but sometimes there is a cost to it. In, in the state of Utah, uh, when, when you're Mormon, you don't pick the church that you attend. There's a church in every corner in Utah, a Mormon church in every corner and you're assigned the church that you go to. And it's a way that the church knows who's attending, church, who's attending church on Sunday and who isn't. And so everyone in my community belongs to one church, one ward. They're always on Facebook talking to each other. You know what's ha happening in the area. And when, when someone doesn't go to church, they know. In fact, every, every street in our neighborhood has a leader in charge of the street to kind of supervise over the street. And if anyone has a need, they help out. If someone missed church, they can go teach the lesson. In Mormon churches all across the world, they teach the same lesson every, every day so, or every Sunday. So, so if someone misses the lesson, they can catch them up. Um, when someone comes to Christ... Everyone around them knows. There is sacrifice to that. Community can ostracize you. Your family can, can disown you. But here's what Jesus is saying to them and, and even to his disciples right now. You're concerned for your life, but here, here's what I want you to know. It's not time to back away. It's time to double down. That's what Jesus is saying here. Guys, when the darkness pushes against us, do you hear me? 
when life feels like it's full of adversity, when people don't maybe like who you are because of Jesus, it doesn't mean all of a sudden you need to be a jerk to people, but here's what Jesus is saying. Don't back down. Double down, and here's why. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. It's not in an idea, it's in a person. It's in him. He, he's the way, he's the direction that we need to go. He is the truth, he is the foundation uh, of our souls. And, and get this, when he is dying, he says, I am the life. What your soul needs in order to discover life is, is to lean into his life. <laughs> Serving in, in Utah, I know a, a missionary couple that we're connected to, to through the organization that we're planting in, and they've been faithfully serving in Utah for over 30 years, have planted a church and went on to help another church plant uh, in the last three years. They've been a part of a new church plant, and, and they, in the last couple of years, got a, the wife got a pancreatic cancer diagnosis. When I was on my way here, I, I got a note when I landed my, the plane, on the plane, turned my phone on, um, her battle is over. She, had, she passed away yesterday. When she started to face this cancer and um, her chemo treatment, you know, she said something to me that I just, I've just cherished, I've held on to. I thought it was just a beautiful way to look at this as an individual who's going to walk by faith in this world. She said this to me. She said, I'm either going to be healed or I'm going to be healed. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And she lived a beautiful life before, before the Lord. Because when I think about my own living for Jesus, one of the things that I have struggled with, especially as a young man, I grew up poor in Huntington, West Virginia. That's where I'm from. I bounced around a little bit in the South. One of my first jobs was in uh, North Carolina in high school, Mooresville. But um, I, I grew up a very shy, painfully shy kid. And, and I, I let that shyness kind of keep me from saying things sometimes. But there, there came a place in life where I realized the importance of who Jesus is and what he stands for is far more important than the way I'm feeling about myself. The promises of God are transforming for, for not only me, but for people around me. And so how, whatever it is I think about myself, I need to stop thinking so much about myself and start thinking a lot more about him because he's what transforms life. He's what changes hearts. I mean, the, the problem that we have in America today isn't a problem for, for, for government. It's a, there, there's not just this Band-Aid fix. The problem that we have for the government to, or in the world today, it's a worship problem. The problem we have in America today, it's a worship problem. As a country, we're, we're in an identity crisis because we're in a God crisis. The only way, the only way forward, it's not for the church to back down, but to double down. Some people look at the, the, the idea of this statement that Jesus gives, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and, and they get frustrated by the exclusive, exclusivity of this, this statement. No one comes to the Father but by me. And I look at this statement and, and I say, man, I am so grateful. I am so grateful that, that God didn't abandon us, that God didn't leave us, but God pursued us and he gave us the opportunity to connect to him in, in the way and to know him who is the life that we could be set free. This is an incredible passage for, for the soul. And this is why Jesus, this is why Jesus desires this in, in verse number, or excuse me, point number three. So that we could watch the beauty of God at work as we follow. So we could watch the beauty of God at work as you follow. Listen to this, John 14, verse 12. Jesus says this, truly, truly, I say to you, the one who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I 
am going to the Father. Could you imagine that? Jesus isn't saying, everyone panic, it's all over. I'm going down, the ship's going down with us. That's not what Jesus says here. He says, greater works than these you will do. I mean, if you try to wrap your head around that for a moment as a, as a disciple in the first century, Jesus is, he's going to sound insane. We're thinking all is over. You're going to die. We're probably going to die now. And Jesus is talking about greater works than these you will do. What does that even mean? Well, let, let me just say, no one will ever do a greater work than Jesus did on the cross, right? That, that work has the opportunity to transform every heart in this world. No one's going to do a, a greater work than what Jesus did. But when Jesus is talking about greater works than these you will do, what Jesus is recognizing is that his ministry took place in Jerusalem. But when the Spirit of God comes to empower the people of God, this work will take place all over the world. What Jesus is talking about is the extent and the magnitude of by which his work will take place. Jesus isn't saying, panic, it's over. Jesus is saying to you guys, now is the time to, to dream and dream big. When I think about these verses, specifically verse 12, greater works than these you would do. Guys, when I think about the church today, if the church really believed that, I wouldn't be standing in front of you and saying, there are cities in Utah with tens of thousands of people and have never had a Christian church. If the church really believed that, not, I'm not saying this church, but the church universally really believed that, there, there would be no extent that we would go to, to not move throughout this world to places, especially in America, to proclaim the goodness of Christ. Luke chapter 17, verse 6, Jesus says, but the Lord said, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. And when you read a verse like that, uh, it's just a surprising verse. Jesus talks about, you know, you're going to be doing greater works. And then all of a sudden, what kind of faith does he tell us to have? Mustard seed faith. And mustard seed faith that's dinky faith. Like, have you ever seen a mustard seed? It's almost, it's almost hidden from the eye as how unimpressively and underwhelming that is, the, a mustard seed faith. Jesus is saying all it takes is mustard seed faith. Uh, that's dinky faith. And I had, had a friend, he gave a wonderful story to me one time he, to, to, to draw the point of all this uh, home. He said, you know, Nathaniel, he said, if you were to take a journey across the United States and had to cross the Mississippi and it was frozen over, he said, would you rather cross the Mississippi River frozen over with, on just a little bit of ice and all, all the faith in the world? Or would you rather cross the Mississippi with a whole lot of ice, but just a little bit of faith? And I said, you know, I want to sound spiritual and say just a little bit of ice and a whole lot of faith, uh, but I'm not that spiritual. So, so I'll take a whole lot of ice and a little bit of faith. And he said, he looked at me and said, that's actually the right answer. There's a right answer. And, uh, and he explained, he said, if you go across just a little bit of ice with a whole lot of faith, the minute you hear that ice crack, guess what happens to your faith? It's gone. But if you go across a whole lot of ice with just a little bit of faith, guess what happens to your faith with every step? It grows. Guys, when it comes to following Jesus in this world, no matter how overwhelming it seems, the power of what takes place isn't up to us. It's not about the size of your faith, but rather it's about the size of your God. That's the beauty of doing ministry no matter where you are. That, at the end of the day, is why I love living in Utah, and that brings me back to the place that is exhilarating because I realize it's not up to me. I am not the Superman, <laughs> but I know the one who is. And all I have to do is faithfully follow him, trusting in the promises he gives because in Jesus there is always hope. 
I'll close with this, this last story. It's a beautiful story related to all this. And I, I just want to share it with you because it's been so important to our family and it's a part of what you've helped us accomplish in Utah in the power of Christ, which he's done through us. Uh, we started our church in, in Lehigh, Utah. I, I originally went to Utah in 2003. And I didn't go to Utah because I was interested in doing a ministry in Utah. I went to Utah because I, I had never seen the Rocky Mountains. Utah's got five national parks for Pete's sakes. I need to go visit Utah, right? So I went and visited Utah. And while I was there visiting Utah, I came across this older couple in their 60s, had just given their life to Jesus. They were from Lehigh. Their name were uh, Pat and Larry Thomas. And, and they looked at me while I was on this trip and they heard that I was in, in uh, ministry training and, and I had a desire to go somewhere and start a church. And they looked at me and they said, if you come back to Lehigh and you start a church here, we'll help you. Two years later, moved back to the area, 2009, we started a church there. We started just in our living room, just the three families. And Pat and Larry were the first ones there. And, and Pat and Larry, they have kids, grandkids, great-grandkids, all live in that area. But uh, Pat well, grew up a Christian, abandoned the faith in her high school years, and, and uh, never followed Jesus again until uh, in, in her 60s. And her, her husband, Larry, grew up Mormon and abandoned his faith in his teenage years and, and never followed the Lord. Came to know Christ in their 60s, uh, raised their kids. None, now, none of their family, none of their kids, grandkids, none of them, none of them followed Jesus. But Pat and Larry, they would always remind my wife and I, they said, will you please pray for our family? Will you please pray for our family? Now, during this COVID period, um, not, not related to COVID, but Pat passed away. And as her, as her health was failing, she continued to look at my wife and I and said, please, please don't stop praying for my family. I'm afraid when I die. No, I don't pray for my family. Please, please keep praying for my family. And she passed away and I did her funeral and I thought that, you know, it's always a good opportunity to talk about the Lord at a funeral. And so I shared about the Lord. And then a few months later, Larry died. Unexpectedly his death was, but Larry passed away. And, and I, I went to that funeral and I conducted the funeral and I talked about Jesus and I just poured out my heart because I, I knew over the years how much they wanted their family just to come to Jesus. And I remember after the funeral that I led, I was going up to the graveside. I called my wife on the way when I was doing the funeral for, for Larry. And, and I just said, I feel so defeated. I mean, we've been 10 years plus just praying for this family and loving on this family. And, and I, this is it. This, I'm going to go to this graveside. And after this, I, I'm, I, who knows if I'll see these people again. And I'm just so discouraged. And I get up, and I get up by the graveside and I just, I, I, I conduct the end of the, the services there. And, and then all of a sudden, one of the grandsons, I sit back in my chair and I'm kind of slumped down. One of the grandsons stands up and he, and he takes his daughter, Pat and Larry's great granddaughter. And they together stand up and all of a sudden they start to sing 10,000 reasons. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. And I just lean forward and I'm thinking, what in the world is happening, right? And, and then he sings, the, he sings the song and everyone dismisses and goes away. And I call my wife back and I'm like, I don't know what to do with this, right? Like I was so discouraged. And then all of a sudden, the, the, someone gets up and sings 10,000 reasons. I can't even, I cannot reason what's happening, you know? And I call her and, and I tell her this and we, and I drive home and I'm like, I don't, I don't know what to do. And, and then a couple months later, in through our church doors, walks Pat and Larry's grandson and his wife and his kids. And they tell us, a couple months ago, we were at a restaurant in Lehigh. Someone came in and shared the gospel. And we put our faith in Jesus. I had nothing to do with this. <laughs> you know, I, was like, I wasn't our church or anything ministering to them. Some random person in a restaurant shares the gospel. They trust in Jesus. I've been, I've been working on you guys for years, right? And, and, they, they, and it's just one random person. But it's a reminder. It's not about me. Guys, one of the beautiful things I could walk away with today and say, I'm not here to impress you with me. But man, I really hope you're impressed with him. It's the hope that he brings and the promises that he gives that gives us a place and an opportunity to follow after him 
and watch his glorious hand work in this world. Thank you, church, for your faithfulness to Jesus. Thank you in ways that you don't even realize sometimes how it's blessing other places in this world. And may you continue to be faithful in following after him. Can I pray for you together? Lord, we love you. We thank you for your glory, your grace, your goodness made known here at OBC. A family away from my family, Lord, I'm just thankful for this church and what it means to us and the ministry in Utah. Lord, bless them. Continue to provide for them as they seek to honor you in all that they do. God, so thankful for where you have them and all the great things happening here. And Lord, we continue to pray that their best day still be before them. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, aren't you thankful for what God's doing in Utah through the Wall family at Alpine Baptist Church? Hey, can we praise the Lord for that? You guys here? (laughs) He's doing great things, man. We are so, so thankful, and we appreciate uh, Nathaniel coming out here to share with us, and um, God is faithful. God is faithful, and he's using you in the middle of all of that. Isn't that incredible? God is so good. Hey, let's celebrate his goodness. Let's worship together right now.
Hey, we want to thank you so much for being a part of the service this week. Whether you were in the room or watching online, God bless you. Remember, He's with you. He's for you. He loves you. We hope you have a great week.